So tomorrow we're going to talk about dog intelligence, dog cognition. But that's not the essence of the matter, is it? We don't have dogs as pets because they're smart. Some of you have smart dogs. I do not. <laughs> my dog has been volunteering in one of my students' experiments, and she is uh, really bad at it. She's a really not very smart dog. But that's not, that's not why we have her in the house, right? I mean, we don't need our dogs to be smart. It can be cute if they are. It can be attractive. It's an added bonus if they are. But that's not the point of them. The point of the dog, as others today have spoken about, is that we have some kind of an intimate relationship with them. I chose as my title, Why Your Dog Loves You So. I was trying to be clever. I thought it sounded good. Rethinking it, I don't think it's quite the right title because it presupposes that which, as a scientist, I need to be testing, and that is, what is your dog's feeling about you? What is the nature of this relationship from the dog's perspective? And so I'm going to go over several things that have already been discussed today. I really would have loved to have had the opportunity to completely rewrite my talk because I learned so much from the talks that went before but it's in the structure of the thing with it being beamed out on the web and so on that I'm not allowed to touch my PowerPoints once I uh, gave them in before the conference started. So I've made a, a few extra notes which I have here on the computer, so if you see me going back and forth, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm up to here. So let's get some ground rules laid out. Several other speakers have spoken about this before. Part of what makes it possible to have an intimate relationship with a dog is that your dog is a tame being. We've also heard people say that dogs are a domesticated species. Let's get, these, let's get this terminology straightened out, because I find that the two terms, taming and domestication, are often used somewhat interchangeably when they're actually processes operating at different levels. So, taming is the process of rearing a young animal of any kind such that it accepts you as a social companion. Domestication is a process that changes over generations to create individual, to create species or subspecies of animals that are easier to tame, that are more readily brought into relationships or at least proximity with human beings. So taming is something that takes place in each individual's lifetime. All of us have tame dogs, but some people have tame members of other species. Some people have tame squirrels. This is a, a good example. The squirrel is a widespread uh, wild animal, but uh, if you search on Google, you can find photographs and videos of people who somehow got hold of little baby squirrels and reared them in their own homes and have tame squirrels. Now, these individual squirrels are tame, but they have not become members of a domesticated species or subspecies. They are tame, but they are not domesticated. Uh, here's another picture of a tame but not domesticated squirrel. You might have seen uh, tame squirrels. Uh, We've been talking about, uh, there's been some discussion about hand-reared wolves. They could be described as tame wolves, but they are not domesticated. They're not members of a domesticated species. Meanwhile, we usually think of the dog, for example, as a domesticated animal and therefore inevitably, ipso facto, a tame animal, but that's not true. I don't know the numbers. I don't know that anybody has done the kind of research that would give us the numbers. But there are dogs, Canis familiaris, Canis lupus familiaris, in the world that are not tame. They did not meet human beings during the critical period for social imprinting, the first, uh, Catherine, um, eight weeks? The first eight weeks of life. They did not meet human beings during their first eight weeks of life. And so they hide in the forests of Siberia, or in fact the forests of the Ukraine, um, and they are wild animals. This is a photograph from the area around Chernobyl, 
And this was, I didn't take this, this is taken by a National Geographic photographer. And you can see that all these dogs are chewing on something. In order to get these dogs to come close enough to have their photo taken, and I'm gonna assume this was taken with a fairly long lens, the photographer had to throw out some food to get these dogs to come into his proximity, some kind of proximity, because these animals, although they are dogs and not wolves, they are not tame. They did not meet people in their first eight weeks of life. They're descended from the pets that the inhabitants of Chernobyl had to leave behind. What is it, 20, 25 years ago now? They are domesticated. They are not tame. And that's a paradoxical concept. But it's an important point to get clear that a the members of a domesticated species are not born tame. They are born with their development changed in certain ways that Catherine uh, very clearly laid out for us, such that they are easy to tame, but they are not born tame. So what's going on here? Well, again, this has already been spoken about to some degree. We have this critical period for social imprinting. I'm not the first person to mention Conrad Lawrence, who shared, as has been previously mentioned, in the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology, together with uh, Carl von Frisch and Nico Timbergen. What Lawrence is most famous for is uh, teaching us, discovering the process of social imprinting, the notion of imprinting. Photographs of Lawrence almost always show him, followed by uh, goslings, they're the classic animals that he showed that if you uh, demonstrate yourself to ducklings, goslings, or any young animal, they will come to imprint on you and they will react to you as if you were a parent figure. Have you seen this particular photograph of Lawrence before? So I stumbled across this on the web and I thought, great, because I'm talking about dogs, so it would be great, because I know Lawrence, he wrote a whole book about dogs, even if he admitted to Ray Coppinger that he got most of it wrong. Uh, <laughs> so surely it makes perfectly good sense that there's a photograph of Lawrence being followed by a puppy. And so I put it into one of my talks. And then later I went back and I had another look at it. What's the date? Where was that exactly? It turns out that I was getting this from the website of somebody who, for their own amusement, photoshops this puppy into other famous photographs. So as well as, for example, this one of Lawrence with the goslings, which makes a certain amount of intellectual sense because we know that Lawrence loved dogs and it fits nicely into my story, he has the same puppy photoshopped into the famous photo of John Lennon and Yoko Ono lying in bed in New York City, uh, in bed for peace. So in fact, this is complete nonsense. Um, but it's a, it's a nonsense that, that tells a story in an interesting kind of way. Um, while I've got Lawrence up here, let me interspice something that I looked up over lunch, because Tim Bergen and Lawrence, the co-founders of Ethology, immensely important individuals in the history of animal behavior science, and are usually spoken of in the same breath. And they, of course, agreed on a number of topics, but they disagreed on a topic that came up this morning, and I think they dis their disagreement's very interesting in that um, they disagreed on the relevance of attempting to study the subjective lives of animals. And Lawrence was much more inclined towards thinking that you could study the subjective lives of animals, but Tim Bergen was vehemently opposed. And um, he said he had some correspondence with Julian Huxley, a contemporary of theirs, mid 20th century uh, British uh, animal behavior scientist. And Tim Bergen said, our inclination to say something about the subjective experience of animals is one of the most serious obstacles to progress. And in this matter, I, I would side with, uh, this has just gone out. I would side, oh, did I press a button perhaps? No? I've lost the uh, feedback monitor here. Um, on, th on that matter, I would side definitely with Tim Bergen against Lawrence. Is it possible to have this back? <laughs> There's no picture on here. No, it says no signal. Okay. The, can the canoe? <laughs> 
I can't tell the same silly stories over and over again. Uh huh. Ah, good, thank you. So the next slide, so I was very anxious as I was listening through Catherine's excellent presentation this morning, because the next slide attempts to summarize what Catherine was talking about, uh, but I wasn't sure that, that it would still stand, but it does seem to be still more or less accurate. So this line represents life. It begins at birth, it proceeds for some indeterminate period of time, and it ends in death. That's true of all lives, that's true of our lives, uh, I'm particularly thinking here about the lives of wolves and dogs. And early in these lives, as Catherine told us, animals go through the critical period for social imprinting, which, for simplicity's sake, we could just call a period of taming. And that period of taming, that Catherine described in beautiful detail, it ends with the onset of fear towards novel stimuli, which, and I think this is still about right, isn't it? If I say it ends at 50 days, that's still more or less in the right ballpark. Now, in dogs, this period is remarkably long. In wolves, it's very much shorter. Am I still OK with 19 days? Oh, darn. <laughs> but it is shorter, right? If we ignore that, no. <laughs> OK, all right. <laughs> but certainly, it's different. And the upshot, <laughs> good, good. The upshot of it being different is that I like to say any seven-year-old can tame a dog. In fact, it's so easy to tame dogs that the phrase to tame a dog actually has a strange ring to our ears, right? It sounds a little odd. You don't usually talk of taming dogs. I've got a new puppy. I've got to tame my puppy. But actually, you do. Actually, you do. You have to give a young dog the opportunity to be socially imprinted onto you and others of your kind. And for that matter, others of whatever other kinds already share your home. If you have a cat, you have to give your dog a chance to be socially imprinted on the cat, too. Uh, but that is so easy in the case of dogs that we don't even talk about it. We skip over it without mentioning it. Whereas when we talk about wolves, Taming wolves is really hard work. This is my student, Nathan Hall, who together with Monique Udell and others and Catherine uh, hand-reared some wolves at Wolf Park, as Wolf Park has been doing for over 40 years. And um, as I think Adam said, it's not something that is recommended to try at home because it's really difficult and any mistakes are accompanied by very high costs, which is to say bites. And it's the wolf biting the person, not the other way around. So that, that's why it's possible to have, an, easily possible to have an intimate relationship with a dog and not with a wolf because it's much easier to tame a dog than to tame a wolf. Now, why is it the case that it's easier? In an evolutionary sense, where does that come from? And this is something that Ray Coppinger talked about yesterday, and this picture is now being shown for the third time at this conference. And this is Ray's picture of dogs at the Mexico City dump. The dogs are not easy to tame because they, in some sense, want to be human companions. The dogs are easier to tame in an evolutionary sense, and the evolutionary answer to the question of why it's easy to tame dogs is because dogs want to maximize us as a food resource. They want to maximize their exploitation of us human beings as a food resource. Both wolves and dogs uh, on different, uh, different locations around the world, scavenge from humans, not just trash dumps, but at, you know, at the kitchen door or whatever. And um, in, in, in doing so, dogs win out compared to what wolves can gain because dogs are more likely to form social relationships with people and are more likely to get closer to people. I'm not aware of anywhere in the world where a direct comparison has been made of wolves and dogs scavenging from the same human population. All I can give you is a comparison of a study in Sweden looking at wolves scavenging and a study in Italy looking at dogs scavenging. At the Swedish site, 
the wolves run away when the people come within 200 meters of them. That effectively means that the wolves run away before the people even see that there are wolves there. Whereas at the Italian site, the dogs don't run away until the people come within five meters of them. So that's a difference of 195 meters. That's a really big difference. And in effect, that means that the dog is a much more efficient scavenger on people than the wolf is. So this decline in flight distance is the evolutionary force that's driving the dog to let people get closer and to allow the possibility of there being social relationships between people and dogs. That's what makes it possible but it doesn't fully explain why it happens. Because we people don't like the animals that scavenge on us. We actually have a special word for the animals that scavenge on us. We call them vermin. We have a special word for them, a special mark of our, how much we despise them for hanging around us. And nobody likes finding vermin around their habitation. Dogs, I think, started out as vermin. And you can visit human communities where dogs are still treated like vermin. But so then the question is, the question becomes, how did dogs make a jump from being vermin to being so closely intimate with us? Here's some more pictures that you've already seen. So, this poor old lady with her puppy has now been shown four times at this conference. <laughs> and that's the second time that I've shown you the skull of the canid that was buried with people outside the uh, cave at Hyanim, Hyanim Cave. And um, Adam already showed the lady with the young canid uh, earlier today. And but so just to Backfill this back, the backstory here, we're talking about the Natufian people, the first human populations to become settled and therefore create piles of trash that, that linger. First human people to become settled in the Middle East in what's now Israel. And there it is, this amazing co-burial. And I already told you yesterday that I saw this at the Hebrew Museum in Jerusalem. I saw it in two locations. Uh, because this is actually a plaster cast of it that's in the Hebrew Museum. That's where I saw it first. And, you know, I was so excited to see it with my own eyes. I, the museum's an enormous, sprawling complex, and I went straight up to information. Wasn't looking around at all. Went straight up to information. I said, I believe you have the bones of the woman who's buried with the puppy, published by Davis and Valor in 1978, and I really want to see this. And the lady's like, who the heck is this guy? She <laughs> says, you know, we have a very interesting exhibition of gold Roman coins. Say, no, no, I've got to see this. It's like, I don't know. She turns to her, to her colleague. Have you heard of that? I don't know. So they look it up in the big book of the museum. Say, oh, room number 37 down here on the left. So I go down there, and I get my camera out before I even get in the room, and I rush up. It's a, it's a, I don't know if it's glass or plastic. It's a big transparent cabinet right in the middle of the room, and I pour over, and I'm taking photos from every angle, thinking, I'm damn well going to make sure I get everything, because I'm probably never coming back here. It's a long, it was a long way. I'm going to make sure I get the whole thing. So I don't know how long I was doing this for, and I don't know what the other museum visitors thought of this crazy guy who was so obsessed with this sort of tray of what are not even real bones. <laughs> Finally, I've like exhausted, I've like exhausted what I can do with this object. You know, I can't open the case and lie down next to her. I've done, <laughs> I've exhausted what's possible with this. And so I stretch and I take a breath and I look around at the room that I'm in. And to my considerable surprise, I'm in a room full of burials. So it turns out that the Natufian people are interesting in our history, in human history, for many reasons. Not just that they were the first people to settle down, but they were the first, among the first people to get serious about burying their loved ones, about making a fuss about their loved ones. And contrary to what Adam said earlier, which I had previously heard, I don't know where, Adam, you and I had heard this, because I had certainly heard the same thing, that is to say that this is unique, that this puppy is unique for being buried with a person. In fact, I'm in a room solely dedicated to the theme 
of what the Natufian people buried their loved ones with. And it turns out that they buried their loved ones with the antlers of a deer. This is the same people around the same locations, around the same time in human history. So that's, that's a, uh, a young man's skull and some of his bones together with the antlers of a deer. And this is a woman's pelvis with fox teeth arraigned along it. And other ones that I didn't bother putting in pictures of, I remember there was also a woman's body with um, turtle shells arranged all around it in a pattern. So in fact, those canid bones have no special status. There's nothing special about the fact that the woman was buried with a canid because those people of that time actually buried their dead along with bits and pieces of a whole range of species. And I also met with an archaeologist who specializes in this field at the Hebrew University there. And she'd said to me that we have no idea why they did this. We have no idea whatsoever. There is nothing, there are no records that can help us understand why the male was buried with antlers, this female was buried with fox teeth along her pelvis, another female was buried with turtle shells. But, it, but we have to say that in that context, the fact that one woman was buried with a dog or a wolf pup is not any special indication of an incipient domestication relationship because we haven't domesticated deer, we never domesticated foxes until 1958 in Siberia, uh, we've never domesticated turtles. So in itself, the co-burial is not a special signal from human history that domestication and a special intimate relationship with dogs was developing at that time. And that time, to remind you, we're talking about 12,000 years ago, which is already very much on the late side compared to the estimates that the geneticists give us. If you want to sift through human history to the first unequivocal evidence that at least a person had a strong emotional bond to a dog, you have to wind forward another 6,000 years. You're only 6,000 years ago when you find a statement like this, a mummified dog, and a statement written, I'm sorry, this is only 4,000 years ago, goodness me. The dog, which was the guard of his majesty, extra credit for being able to pronounce his name, his majesty ordered that he be buried, that he be given a coffin from the royal treasury, fine linen in great quantity, incense. His majesty gave perfumed ointment and ordered that a tomb be built for him by the gang of masons. His majesty did this for him in order that he might be honored. So 4,000 years ago, uh, you can actually find somebody committing the thought that this dog be honored. The dog was buried alongside a baboon. There's no inscription with the baboon. Whether the dog and the baboon were friends, we don't know. Uh, the baboon has had his incisor teeth removed, presumably to stop him biting people. Um, so four to 6,000 years ago, there is evidence. 4,000 years ago, a statement. 6,000, I'm sorry, why do I keep saying 6,000? Stop saying 6,000. 4,000 years ago, a painting on a sarcophagus of what is clearly a dog with a collar. There are lots of collars have survived that were buried in tombs in ancient Egypt. Uh, a leash. And this, so, so we recognize here the accoutrements of controlling dogs that we still have today, collar, leash. Interestingly, this person is carrying a stick with a hand shape on the end of it. That's an accoutrement for controlling dogs that we no longer have and we don't know what its function was. These are the, this is the oldest dog with a name. And I have spent some time giving talks about this, telling people that the dog's name is Kuv and the person's name is Lupu. But I don't, I don't know, I've been thinking about it. <laughs> and it seems, it, would, it seems an astonishing coincidence that the dog's name is within one letter of the Roman, of the Latin for wolf. So I wonder if the dog was Lupu, 
and whether that perhaps was the ancient Egyptian for dog or wolf. And if so, isn't it remarkable, I find it very remarkable that the ancient, an ancient word for dog or wolf is almost the same as the name in the, among the Mayangna people for dog. Remember I told you yesterday I went hunting with the Mayangna people. I know just two or three words of Mayangna, and one of them is dog. And their word for dog is Sulu. Here's the thing. They go hunting with these dogs. The dog runs off. Remember I told you the dog runs off. It's chasing something. And the men are trying to keep up with the dog. And they're hoping that the dog in its excitement will bark so that they can follow the sound of the barks. But unfortunately, the dogs don't always bark. The dogs sometimes run off quietly. And so you're stuck there. You're in the rainforest. You, you know, they're not just going for a walk for the sake of it. So they go up to a high point, and you know what they do? They shout, Sulu! And that's why their word for dog is Sulu, because it's a good word to shout from a hilltop. Well, Lupu is just the same kind of word. Lupu! It's an excellent word to shout from a hilltop. So is it possible that the Latin for wolf derives from an ancient Egyptian word used to call your dog when you are hunting? As I've started looking at this, a number of languages use as their word for dog something that would be really good to shout from a hilltop. The Russian for dog is sabaka. Sabaka. It's interesting, isn't it? You couldn't do that with dog, interestingly enough. You couldn't shout dog. It wouldn't work. You want an open vowel sound for it to work. But the word dog is actually a very recent, very recent word. The word. If you look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, the word dog only entered the English language in the 14th century and has no precursor in any other language. So, okay, all right. So, 4,000 years ago, we're looking at the suggestion of intimate relationships between people and dogs. Uh, go forward a little bit. 3,000 years ago, famous story, you've surely heard it before. Odysseus has been out on his travels. When he returns home, he's in disguise. People don't recognize him. Lying on a dung heap, he sees his dog Argus close to death. Even though he's disguised, the dog recognizes him, wags his tail, and dies. And the man, seeing his dog reduced to an animal that dies on a dung heap, sheds a tear. Now, Ray Coppinger correctly reminded me that this is Homer's uh, Odyssey is a story, not, not a factual thing. If you, do the, if you do the math, apparently Argus would have to be 25, or was it 28 years old? 29, 29 years old. So you don't want to pin too much on it. But at the very least, it tells us that Homer could assume that his audience could accept such a thing as possible, that there could be an intimate relationship between a man and a dog. If we want to really get to what I find exquisite evidence, beautifully expressed, of the relationship between man and dog, fast forward another thousand years, Ariane wrote a beautiful book on hunting with hounds, and he praises his dog in there in the most beautiful terms. And for this to make sense, you have to know that although we call him Ariane, he referred to himself as Xenophon in honor of an earlier ancient Greek who had uh, also written a book about dogs. Here's what Ariane said about his dog. I myself reared a hound with the grayest of gray eyes, and she was fast and a hard worker and spirited and agile, so that when she was young, she once dealt with four hairs in a day. And apart from that, she is most gentle and most fond of humans, and never previously did any other dog long to be with me and my fellow huntsman Margellus as she does. She escorts me to the gymnasium and sits by while I am exercising, and goes in front as I return, frequently turning round as if to check that I have not left the road somewhere. When she sees I am there, she smiles and goes on again in front. And because when she was being trained as a puppy, she was punished with a whip, if anyone, even to this day, so much as mention a whip, she goes up to the one who has said it and crouches down like one beseeching and fits her mouth to his mouth as if she is kissing and jumps up and hangs from his neck 
and does not let him go until the angry one gives up the threat. And so I think that I should not hesitate the, to write down the name of this dog for it to survive her even in the future, that Xenophon the Athenian had a dog called Horme, very fast and very clever and quite out of this world. I don't think anybody could top that for a beautiful description of a dog and for evidence of what a man's relationship to a dog could be. I very much wanted my dog to be called Horme um, in honor of Arian's Horme. But my wife said, look, we're not going to the dog park and shouting out, Horme, Horme, <laughs> around the dog park. So, all right. So, we see historically that a bond between people and dogs developed. I don't think it developed 12,000 years ago, but by 4,000 years ago, we definitely know it's there. We don't suppose that it was everywhere. It's not everywhere today. Remember I said I went to Nicaragua and I went to see the Mayangna people. I cannot now remember whether, I, I know I mentioned that I had to go on this damn canoe for two days and the left buttock and the right buttock. And, um, but did I mention that along the river banks, there are these different people, the mosquito people. Maybe I did, maybe I did. And the mosquito people's dogs are desperately thin. That's a mosquito village dog on the left, desperately thin dogs. Whereas the Mayangna people have dogs that are in considerably better condition. And so I think that, that we have a two-stage process here. The dogs first colonize us and a vermin, but at some stage, dogs begin to become useful and we start to develop an affection for them as this usefulness comes, comes forward. Now, um, okay, all right. I, I have to throw in, because this, this for a long time has been one of my favorite paintings, for a long time. It's a beautiful painting of a church in the Netherlands, painting done by Senradam in 1636 of the, I'll just say it in English, Grote Kirk, the big church in Harlem in Amsterdam. And it was my favorite painting for a long, long time. And I was actually on my way to the Netherlands and was stopping in London, where they have the painting. And uh, I had never before noticed, I'd never really been focused on this, that there's a dog in the foreground here. And this is, this is that part of the picture zoomed in. In fact, the dog is the only individual listening to this preacher. There's a <laughs> And in fact, if you look at these famous Dutch church paintings, they all have dogs in them. It's really quite interesting. And, um, and so that tells us a little about how widespread dogs were in Western Europe by the 18th century. Okay, so I don't want to just tell you stories, much as I greatly enjoy doing that. I want to tell you scientific stories. How do we do science on the intimacy of people and dogs? Well. It's not easy, but it can be done. And a Japanese group that I was able to visit in Tokyo, uh, the key researcher here is Miho Nakasawa, and this is a Zabu University, who have a thoroughly enviable special dedicated building for dog research that they call the Companion Dog Laboratory. And in there, they have been studying the emotional bond between people and their dogs. Uh, uh, um, Michael Fox this morning talked a little about uh, heart rate changes. What Nagasawa and colleagues have been looking at is oxytocin, which people jokingly call the love hormone. It's a hormone released in people and in other animals, other mammals, in response to strong emotional bonds. So it's released in women when they're breastfeeding um, uh, and in other forms of interactive, uh, affectionate interaction, uh, it's released at orgasm. Uh, it's, it's, as I say, it's the love hormone. It's not actually very easy to measure changing levels of oxytocin. To carry out this experiment, they had to take repeated urine samples, which is from the people, which is not easy to do. But they, they were able to do it. And so the experiment had two conditions to it. In one condition, the people uh, were given the opportunity to gaze at their dogs. In the other condition, the people had to carry out a difficult uh, pen and paper task. Their dog was present, but they were not allowed to look at their dogs. 
And what they found was that for people who had a strong relationship with their dogs, the amount of oxytocin in their urine was correlated with the amount of eye contact that they were able to make with their dogs. So that's one line of evidence that, uh, that there is this emotional bond between people and their dogs. I've been collaborating recently with a child psychologist, and we're interested in the question of the degree to which dogs provide emotional support to children. Well, we're not going to ask children to give us repeated urine samples. That would be too difficult. So what we have been looking at, instead of looking at oxytocin, is we've been looking at the hormone cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And cortisol is much easier to measure because it uh, appears in saliva, and it appears very quickly in saliva. So all we need to do is to get saliva from the children, which we do by having them and their dog lick and I, no. Um, <laughs> there are safer, cleaner methods. They make these things. You just have to get the kids to spit, which uh, is not too difficult. Most children, we're using um, nine, eight, nine, ten-year-old children. Most of them are able to spit for us. We have to get them to spit repeatedly whilst we give them a stressful task. Now, as the other speakers will surely join me in attesting, the, one of the most stressful things you can ask somebody to do is to give a speech in front of others. So we have been putting children through what's called the Trier Social Stress Test, which means that you bring them into a room where they're confronted by a panel of people who, to make it as scary as possible without actually harming the children, the people are wearing white coats, lab coats, and they have to give a speech about themselves. They're given just a few moments to prepare the speech, and then they have to give the speech. That's called the Trier Social Stress Test. Now, nowadays, uh, I don't know how many of you are in this kind of a game, but um, when you do research on children, there are a great many protections in place. So I cannot show you a photograph of the children doing this task or a video. So instead, here is a graphic representation of what this is like. This is a painting called When Did You Last See Your Father? And I remember it's in the National Gallery in London. I remember as a kid going up to London and seeing this painting and, and I don't know whether it comes across here, but always thinking, my goodness, that would be very scary. This is the English Civil War. The child, the boy, you can tell from his dress, is a, uh, a royalist, whereas the, the men interrogating the boy are, um, are um, what do you call them? Oh, darn. Uh, roundheads, that's what we call them. That's the, the sort of Republicans, to put it in terms you might understand. Um, <laughs> And so they're interrogating the child about the location of his father, who's run away uh, to avoid being captured by the opposite side. And so this gives you a rough impression of what it's like for these children to be forced to give a speech in front of a rather unsympathetic audience. And so along the way, we have the children spit into little cups for us every 20 minutes. And we can take that home and we can measure how much cortisol is in the children's spit. And uh, here's, here's what that looks like. Here's time since the onset of the task. So the arrow there at zero, that's where the task starts. Times that are negative means before they have to start doing the task. And times that are positive means times that are after that task. And I should warn you, this is very preliminary data. There are only six kids in each group. Uh, there are a number of reasons why, uh, even though the experiment's nearly finished, you cannot do more. Anyway, there we are. So here we go. Here's a child that has his parent, usually mother. It's usually the mothers that bring the kids in for this. They also bring the dog. Parent, mother, and dog all show up at our laboratory. But if the child is in the parent group, the dog is put in a different room, and doesn't star in this experiment at all. And the child goes with his or her mother into the room to do the stressful task. And here you see the levels of the stress hormone cortisol which do go up a little in those children that have to do the task, even if their mother is with them. They're showing some sign that they are stressed. But if the poor kid is in the group that they have to do the task on their own, you can see that their cortisol levels go through the roof. There's a big difference here. They're a lot more stressed if they have to do this on their own than if they have to do it with their mother. What we're interested in is what does the dog do? If the kids are in the group where they get to do the test with the dog and the mother is put in the other spare room, are they as stressed as if they were alone? Are they as stressed as if they had their mother there? Are they something in between? 
in these early data, there is no evidence to suggest that the dog has a stress buffering role. I'm not yet willing to say that that is the final answer. Uh, we also asked the children about their relationship with the dog. There's no point attempting to incorporate that analysis into this preliminary data because there are only six kids in each group here. We're working on 30 children in each group. Once we have 30 children in each group, we'll be able to look at the cortisol response, the stress hormone response, as a function of the child's relationship with their dog. And so it's possible that children that say, yes, they do have a strong relationship with their dog will show a buffering effect, whereas kids who report that their relationship with their dog is much less close, they may not be showing the relationship. But um, it's, still, it's still early days, but it's worth thinking about. It's worth considering. OK. All right. The reason we do experiments is because we don't know the answer. And even if it's a part of our lives that we feel is so integral, we still do the experiment, and we're prepared to be proven wrong. It could be that dogs do not actually buffer stress in children. The, if you look at the overall literature on dogs as stress bufferers in general populations, results are extremely diverse, and many of the studies that do report positive effects are highly self-selecting samples. And you look at studies that are more random samples. So for example, in Germany, for decades, they have done a massive national questionnaire on very, very large samples. And this is not driven by people with a particular interest in dogs or anything else. They ask all sorts of questions about people's health and stress and lives in general. This is run by the German government. One year, they actually did include the question, do you have a dog? They also have questions about how old people are. And what's interesting is that in that massive random sample, people who had a dog took more painkillers if they were in the 30 to 50 year old age range. And so what that suggests is that in that large random sample, if you were of an age where you likely have children, and you, may, you were also in the age group where you are most likely to be caring for ailing parents yourself, then having a dog may well be just one more headache. So there are, there are diverse results. So you know we tell each other stories about dogs, but the stories we tell are not necessarily representative of what dogs really are. So here's a famous old story about dogs. Uh, I think I've got a video. No, I don't have that video. I do have that video. We're doing things. No, it looks like we don't have that video. Well, that doesn't matter too much, so long as it's the only video we haven't got, because that's just for fun. Uh, you know the story of Lassie, the dog who uh, always helps the children, captures the bad guys, and, uh, and so on. We don't have that video. All right, it doesn't matter. Um, the reason I had that video was just to be funny, uh, to introduce fascinating research by Bill Roberts and Krista McPherson at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. Krista McPherson actually thought, wouldn't it be interesting to test whether dogs really do recognize that their owners are in difficulty and need some help, like Lassie always does on the TV show. And the first experiment they did, they had people take their dog for a walk in a park and then fake a heart attack. And uh, it was the funniest scientific conference presentation I have ever seen. Bill Roberts, has, uh, Bill Roberts is completely deadpan. You would never have guessed that anything amusing was going to come from his mouth. And he just described what was going on. And then he showed these videos made by a student hiding up a tree in the park. And it was always set up so that there was somebody reading a newspaper on a park bench fairly close to where the owner faked the heart attack. And so you see, from a tree perspective, somebody walking along with their dog on a leash. And then they go, Ugh, uh, and they fall down on the ground. 
And the dogs sniff a little bit at the person, can't walk enough to recognize that they're no longer being held on the leash, and then you just see them run off out of the camera <laughs> shot. One after another after another, they just run off out of the camera shot. That's why I was, I was, that was reminded of this when Adam was talking yesterday about pet dogs as captive animals, because yeah, you let go of the leash and they just disappear out of camera shot. People criticized that study. They said, well, the dogs, they did sort of sniff at the people first. And so maybe they could tell that no real heart attack had taken place. And so Bill and Krista did a follow-up study, and I really hope we have the next video, because they did a follow-up study that was more tightly controlled. And what you're going to see if we have this video is you're going to see an owner and a dog on a leash. They're going into a large, I think it's a gymnasium. And first, the owner goes up to a human being and sort of says hello, giving the dog a clear chance to see that here is another human who might be able to bring help. And then, well, let's hope we have the video, because it would be a heck of a shame not to have it. Uh, no, no, yeah, this should be it. Do we, do I need to do something? So, here we go. Here's the owner and the dog, they're coming in to, I think it's a gymnasium, I'm assuming it's, or maybe it's a doggy daycare, I'm not sure. Anyway, a large area, okay, they're going into a reception room. Where you see there's another person and the two people are doing human greetings and look, the dog's, the dog's aware there's a person there, right? There's no question that the dog doesn't know that there's somebody there. Okay, now they go into the next door room, come on. And there's a bookcase. I'm gonna go and look at the books. Okay, here's the bookcase. Mm, nice bookcase. Mm, interesting book. They did this with 30 dogs. They got the same result 30 times. And as I say, it's a refinement. In the first experiment with the heart attack, the person did not explicitly instruct the dog to try and get help. And as I say, there was the issue that the dog could perhaps tell that it wasn't a real heart attack, whereas this really is a bookcase. If you do this same experiment on children, this is enough of a prompt that children, small children, will go. Okay, there's no getting help. There's no getting help. And um, as I say, they did this with 30 different dogs. They kept the owner trapped for six minutes, which is a long time. And in the whole six minutes, not once did any of the dogs ever attempt to get help. So uh, they used different breeds of dogs. They intentionally chose dogs that people say are smart, like Collies, Retrievers, German Shepherds, a Poodle. Uh, some of them stayed close to the owner, some of them wandered off, none of them did anything useful whatsoever. <laughs> so I was, I, was, uh, I was reminded of, um, of something that David Hume said. When we, when we hear of dogs doing amazing things, I think Hume's advice is good advice. And I've, I've well, I'll tell you his advice first. No testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle, 
unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. A wise man, therefore, proportions his belief to the evidence. So when I hear of dogs doing amazing things, I consider how, much, how miraculous it would be and whether it would be more miraculous for the testimony to be false, for this not to be the case. I visited South Korea. South Koreans are phenomenally proud of the Jindo dog, which lives on Jin Do, Jin Island. And uh, they tell stories that one of the ways that you know the Jindo dog is an exceptionally intelligent dog is several stories of Jindo dogs that were lost hundreds of miles from home, hundreds of miles from home, but found their way back. Well, they only built the bridge to Jindo, to Jindo Island, 20 years ago. And yet these stories date back to the 19th century. And the strait that separates the island from the mainland is exceptionally fast flowing. There's no way a dog could ever swim across it. So there's no way that these dogs were finding their way, their way home. I also, uh, a long time ago now, I was approached by somebody who believed that dogs along the lines that Rupert Sheldrake lays out have a telepathic ability to know when their owners are coming home. And Rupert Sheldrake actually published a paper on this in which he claimed to show that dogs became restless around the time that their owner was leaving work to start to come home and at least 20 minutes before the dog could possibly have heard the motor of the car returning to their home. Now, in fact, the data were not particularly convincing because the owner tended to come home around the same time each day. But somebody offered me $5,000 to look into it, and so we started to look into it. <laughs> and um, well, because I think, I, you know, I mean, I try and keep an open mind. I think, although I, I wouldn't be inclined to imagine a, a supernatural explanation for it, I still think the phenomenon could be worth investigating. And so we put um, laptop computers with webcams into people's homes. We advertised on Craigslist for people who believed that their dogs had psychic abilities. And those people that responded, we lent them laptop computers with webcams and uh, filmed their dogs while they were out and had them keep a diary of when they set off to return home so that we could then match that with the video analysis. The people coding the video were undergraduate students who were blind to the hypothesis. It's easy to keep undergraduate students in the dark, um, <laughs> especially if you're a professor. Um, and so we had these videos, and my God, they're boring. You wouldn't believe. You know what your dog does when you're not there? Sleeps on the right side for a couple of hours, stands up, stretches, farts, sleeps on the left side for a couple of hours. That's all they do all day long. And as for any suggestion that they could tell when their owners were coming home, you could, you could predict that the door, you could, there wasn't enough, the sound wasn't good enough to hear the car coming on the video or the door being opened. But then the dogs were only reacting a few seconds before the, you saw the human walk into the shot. Now, we did this for a while. It was getting very boring. And then I, I, I got report that one of the owners, I'm not going to go into any details, but one of the owners had forgotten that they had a computer with a webcam in their living room. And I said, no, we've, I'm sorry. You know, we've got to pull the plug on this. So we, and, and we deleted all of the videos. So we never published that, and we never will. All right. So let's get, let's get to another experiment, another experiment on what dogs make of people. And this is my student, Erica Feuerbacher, who uh, is the most behavioristic of my students. Well, she might be listening. She wouldn't mind that. Um, <laughs> she went to one of the local shelters, and she just asked the dogs to do something for her, and she would reward them for it. And she, she intentionally chose something extremely simple, because we didn't want to get into a long training process. We wanted to see what do the dogs find rewarding, not how do we shape them to do something complicated. So she's just going to see, you're going to see in this video, she's going to hold out her right hand like that, open palm, and she expects the dog to just touch her palm with its nuzzle, and she'll reward it with a piece of food from a little bag she has on her left hip. So let's see that video. Now here you go, this is a, a German Shepherd. Do I need to do something? This seems to be different from yesterday's procedure. Yeah, 
I'll tell you the story if it's going to be difficult. Because it's a very simple story. The dog will do it. The dog will touch Erica's hand and rapidly will become very quick and efficient at this. Little bit of dog treat, pup peroni or whatever it was. The dog is very willing and happy to do that quickly and efficiently. And she did this with each dog for three minutes and the dogs get a lot of the treats. Okay, so that's not exciting, is it? That's not interesting. You're not surprised that you can get a dog to do a little bit of work for you in turn for a dog treat. It would be really nice if we had the next video, which is, oh, okay, this is the first video. So there you go. In the interest of time, can I skip across this on the next one if I do that? Can we skip, just go straight to the next video, which is the much more interesting one? So in this video, instead of giving the dog a tangible treat, Erica is going to stroke this dog and tell him that he's the best dog she's ever known. Now, it would be really nice if we could have this video. Do we have this video quickly? Okay, so this is the same dog getting social reward. What a good dog. What a good dog. What a good puppy. You can see that actually really very quickly the dog is losing interest. And there's going to be a cut in the video and we go to the end of the three minute period. You see the dog would really just rather go back to her, his cage. This is a dog in a shelter that's been brought out of its cage for this opportunity for social interaction. Now you might say that it's because the dog has already received some treats and is now showing frustration that the treats have stopped, but that's not the case. Half of the dogs, the social reward came first and that doesn't make any difference at all. So here's, here's, some, here's some summary data then. These are dogs at a shelter and this is how often they touch their nose to her hand in a three minute period and for food, they do it at a quite astonishingly high rate. I'm sorry, it's a five minute period, but they still do it at an astonishingly high rate. For social reward, they will do it some, but only one third as much. Extinction means that she gives them nothing at all, and you can see that this extinction is lower still than the social. So social reward is reward. It's better than nothing. But in terms of what it's worth to the dog, it's worth very, very much less than the food. Now. These were dogs at the shelter. You might argue that these dogs at the shelter are not interested in being told by Erica, who we all know is not even being sincere about this, being told by Erica that they're the best dog she's ever met, right? It could be that it's precisely because they're at the shelter that they don't have a significant human in their lives. That might be why you get this pattern of results. So Erica has two dogs of her own, and she went home and she repeated the experiment on her own dogs. And my God, was she crestfallen. Because actually, her own dogs were as little interested in doing this very simple task for her telling them sincerely that they're the best dogs she's ever known as the shelter dogs. And she then went on and she got a whole bunch of people to do this for her with their own dogs. And what you actually see is, I've already clicked, haven't I? You see that the owned dogs, the pet dogs, show, if anything, an even more dramatic difference between food reward and social reward. And in the owned dogs, on average, social reward is barely distinguishable from extinction. Social reward of that kind under these conditions is worth very, very little to the dogs. We also, because of our association with Wolf Park in Indiana, were able to repeat the experiment on some hand-reared wolves and the pattern of results is again very, very similar. <laughs> now, I don't want you to go home and say, Dr. Wynn said that science proves that dogs don't care how you treat them or that they have no interest in what you might do to them aside from feed them as a reward because that's not the case. We've been developing this and what we're finding is that what matters is the context and the setup. So there's a new experiment that I haven't yet got uh, slides of where the, the owner comes home to the dog, having left the dog all day. And the door of the owner's home is opened ingeniously so that the dog, who hears that the owner has come home and has come up to the door, as the door opens, the dog is confronted by a choice between a bowl of tasty dog food and the owner. And under those conditions, 
dogs uniformly go to the owner first. Even if you repeat the experiment, I mean, once a, you wouldn't do it more than once a day because it's probably quite important that the dog has been alone for some time. Uh, even if you repeat the experiment, the dogs come to realize that as well as the beloved owner, there is also going to be a bowl of food. And you get some really quite amusing situations where the dog will come and greet the owner and then dart across to the food bowl, stuff as much in its mouth as it possibly can, and then run back to the owner to complete the greeting. Okay. So um, if Prescott ever invites me back, I'll have that data ready for you next time. I have one more experiment I want to tell you about. We were talking, I think this came up yesterday, maybe in the discussion session. We were talking about, um, we were talking about infant mortality in dogs. We were talking about how uh, in the Bahamas, only one in 20 dog pups reach their first birthday. And that outside of the first world pets, this is, this is quite common. Dogs uh, have evolved to have multiple litters a day. And we were talking about how dog parental care is extremely weak. That whereas the other species in the genus Canis are notable for the rich biparental care, mothers and fathers helping to rear their offspring for an extended period, often yearlings helping at the den and so on, that this is not true in dogs. In situations where dogs live, like in the Bahamas, street dogs, street dogs anywhere in the world, the mothers are going to wean their pups six, seven, eight weeks, and most of those pups are going to die. They are not at a stage of life where they can effectively forage for themselves. An adult dog is an effective scavenger, an effective forager, forager in human environments, but an eight-week-old pup is not. And what likely, nobody has actually directly studied this, but what likely makes the difference in a pup's survival is human intervention. I'm hypothesizing that the one in 20 of eight-week-old pups that makes it, makes it because humans adopt it. And I thought it would be interesting to do an experiment on humans. I never do experiments on humans. There are so many of them around. It seems a shame not to make more use of them. <laughs> and. Um, and so I, I found an undergraduate student who had good access to dog breeders and was able to get hold of a large number of photographs of dog pups of known ages where the, their headshots and the headshots are at least tolerably similar to each other. And so here is a series, just a, a small sample of the many photographs that Nadine Chassini got for us, dog pups at different ages. And my intuition, my personal feeling says, these are Jack Russells, by the way. She did two other breeds, but she works in Dutch and Italian, and I can't make out what they are. But this is clearly a Jack Russell. Um, I think that this pup looks cutest around, I'm not even sure this is one pup, but the pups of Jack Russells are looking cutest around seven or eight weeks. It's a very simple experiment. You just put a photograph on the computer screen, it has a, underneath it says, how cute is this pup? And there's a slider, and you can slide it up and down, and then you click go when you've made your choice, how cute you think this pup is. And this experiment has hardly started. These are very preliminary data. I'm going to show you average cuteness ratings as a function of the age of the pups. And there it is. You can see that these, at least undergraduate students at the University of Florida, definitely rate pups as cutest around five, six, seven, eight weeks of age. If they're younger than that, they're not as cute. And as they age from then on, there's a gradual drop in cuteness. There's a definite suggestion of a signal that human beings are responding to dog pups at precisely the ages where the dog pups need people to step in if they're going to survive to adulthood. So, there we are. That, that will have to do. Thank you to my many collaborators who I already named yesterday. And as I like to say, may your dog go with you.